On January 17th, 1994, the largest earthquake in 100 years hit Los Angeles. I don't know if you remember this. I was five, so I don't remember this. Um, But everyone in that city lost power. People went into the streets, and they looked up, and they saw something they had never seen before. Right? What do you think they saw? They saw a giant, silvery-looking cloud, and people started to call 911, not because of the earthquake, but because of the giant silvery cloud. So many people, for the first time in their lives, saw the Milky Way. See, it had been there the entire time, but the world had drowned it out. I was 19 when someone on a stage like this gave that illustration. And they did what I'm about to do with you, show you the Milky Way. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. That God's heart from Genesis to Revelations is his name's praise among the nations. And that's our desire too, that God throughout the history of all things has had one rhythm, a pursuit of the nations for his glory and their satisfaction. This plan, this mission has been here all along, right? We know this, but so many of us have just been too busy, are too distracted, are too indifferent, are too blinded to see it. So in this series, Renewed for Missions, uh, Renewed for Mission, we will answer questions like this. So this is to give you a gauge of where we're headed. What is the basis for mission, missions, in our Bible? We'll answer that question today. What's our motivation for joining God's Mission. How will God complete his mission? When will the mission be complete? What is the global state of missions? Like how much has actually been accomplished? What's happening in the world today? What is an unreached people group? Does the rhythm of our life match God's rhythm in the Bible? How should we think of the needs in our city versus the world? Are those competing things? Like, if we're a church that cares about the needs in our city, does that mean that we neglect the needs of the world? And vice versa, if we are going to be a church that cares about the nations, does that mean that we put the needs of our city on hold? Are those two things competing against each other? How do we be a light in this world without becoming like the world? And what does it mean to be called to something? Like you may have heard someone say, well, I'm called to go to China, or I'm called to buy that house. What does calling mean in the Bible? Where do we see it? But for today, I want to show you the foundation for missions. From Genesis to Revelation, a thread that goes all the way through every single book. And this is just a sneak peek. It would take us months to go through every single text where God mentions the nation's But there is a thread here that connects every character, every story, and every book to one theme. So here's a question to help us start, okay? Because this is a big topic. When you think about missions, what verses come to mind? What verses do you think of? For many of us, you're going to think of the old faithful great commission, go and make disciples of all Nations that for years, the church, rightfully so, has singled out this passage as the mantra for missions. But the biblical foundation of missions goes a lot deeper than that. And I want to show you that, that the plan of redemption in God's mission is the theme of our Bible, his glory among all people. And so I pray that we would see the Milky Way. See that this isn't just a collection of books with no theme and no purpose, that every single book and every single story has one message, one purpose. So just a little advice. Um, The first half of my sermon, we're going to fly through a lot of scriptures. And so if you're going to try to follow along in your Bible, maybe you won Bible drill as a a kid. I don't know. Um, You can attempt it, but what I would actually encourage you to do is just to take a pen and a paper or your notes app and your phone and just write these scriptures down in this first half because we are going to fly as I show you this thread, okay? So here we go. We're going to start where God started. Start in Genesis. Genesis 1 
28, it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. God says, I want the earth to be filled with my glory. That's my goal, to fill the earth with my glory. But that doesn't happen, right? Because in Genesis 3, we know that sin had infected the world, that we were separated from God. And this sin isn't just an oopsie, like, oops, didn't mean to do that. The stain of sin goes much deeper than we think, even today. That sin that you play around with, that stain is deeper than you think. And only Christ can heal you. And so by chapter 8, the whole world has fallen into sin. So God floods the earth and he starts over. And then listen to the command that he gives Noah just after he steps off the ark. Genesis 9 verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Hey, Noah, don't just populate a city. Fill the earth. It's, it's there again, that command to multiply. Fill the earth with worshipers. So the question when we get to Genesis 11 is, does God do it? Does he fill the earth with worshipers? Genesis 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language one language, and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Who are they worshiping? Themselves. How many of us today, this is what we're living for? Our goal and ambition is our own glory, that we can be so focused on building our own brand, our own name, that we forget the purpose we were created for. So now the question is, how is God going to respond? Genesis eleven seven. he says, come, let us go down there and confuse their language confused their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Today, there are over 6,000 languages. 6,000. So the question now is, how is God going to gather all the people of the world? They don't speak the same language. They are full of sin. How is God going to fill the earth with worshipers? So God has a problem. The people are scattered, speaking all kinds of different languages. The question of the Bible is, how is he going to accomplish the mission of his glory, his praise among all nations? Then we get to Genesis 12. Genesis 12 is God's response to the tower a Babel, it's the answering of that question. How is God going to accomplish this? How is he going to gather all the scattered people? He says, Abram, leave. Leave your country. Leave everything you know. Leave your life. Leave your dreams. Leave your potential future. Leave your ambitions. Leave, leave the protection and security of your family. Leave everything that you have and go to the land I will show you. And he says, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This may be the most important passage in our Bible. Every passage is important, but this moment sets off a domino effect, a trajectory for every other story, that God's purpose is summarized in this one passage. Every story can be connected back to this moment, to this promise. To this promise. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, because this promise would lead to a king. This promise leads to a king that would lay down his life for you, for the Muslim, for the Hindu, for the person across the street. This promise leads to a king that would bless us. And that blessing is the forgiveness of sins. So Genesis 12, 4, it says, So Abram left as the Lord had told him. He leaves. Man obeys God. Abram is off to establish a nation that will bless all peoples, and get used to hearing that, that God will bless all people. It's only said about 1,600 times in your Old Testament. 1,600. It's a reminder 
that God is, has a plan in providence. He reminds him again in Genesis 15, verse 5, he reminds Abram, he says, he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, think of Revelation, the text in Revelation, a great multitude and no one could number them. You're supposed to remember that. He says, then he said to them, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted to him as righteousness. He gives the same command to Abraham's son, Isaac, Genesis 26, 4. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And then Isaac's son, Jacob, in Genesis 12, 28, 14, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the east and to the west and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. You begin to see this thread take place. That God has a plan and in his sovereignty he is moving all the pieces for a purpose. The coming of a king that will conquer sin so the nations shall be blessed. And you can go through every story. And I challenge you to do this. All those old Sunday school stories that you grew up listening to and hearing, go through and see the thread. The Ten Commandments, right? Why do we have the Ten Commandments? Why did God give Israel the Ten Commandments? Because those scattered nations were watching. They were watching. Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 and 6. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land you are entering to take possession of. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who, when they hear all these statues, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What about the ten plagues? Why did God unleash the ten plagues on Egypt? Was it to free the people from Pharaoh? Yes, we all seen the movie, but it's more than that. Exodus 9, verse 14, he's talking to Pharaoh, and he says, for this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself, and on your servants and your people, so why? So that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up, Pharaoh, to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You remember Rahab? God parts the Red Sea, and then Israel begins to go through the world, and then they run into a girl named Rahab in Joshua 2.9. And it says, I, Rahab, know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water for the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. So the world is beginning to hear about this God and what he can do. What about King Solomon and his wisdom? We, We got a lot of these. Why did God give Solomon such Wisdom, 1 Kings 4, 34, and people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is Joshua uh, chapters 5 and 6, the Battle of Jericho. Some of you may know this story, um, but there's, it's the first major, ba- major battle in the Promised Land, right? There are massive, massive walls around this city, and Joshua has been leading and training the Israelites for this battle for 40 years. And the question is, how are they going to take this city, how are they going to do it? They, can, they have five options. They can go under the wall. They can go over the wall. They can break through the wall. They can do a Trojan horse, Troy kind of thing, Brad Pitt leading the charge, um, go into the city, or they can starve the people out and make them open the gates. So God comes to Joshua, and he says, here's the battle plan. Here's the battle plan. Get your music, guys, and get them to play some tunes. And, and once you've played a few songs, make everyone shout. What? <laughs> Can you imagine training for a battle for 40 years, and then you turn to your soldiers and say, we're going to give this one to the trumpets? <laughs> Did you imagine that? It would be crazy. Why? For the glory of God among the nations. That's why. Who do you think got that glory? Do you think it was Joshua? Soldiers? Do you think the trumpet players got glory for that? No. Only he could do that. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You remember that story? I googled the bunny song this week. 
because I had never seen it before, but I've heard my wife sing it. Um, so I Googled it, and that is two minutes that I will never get back. <laughs> so if you've never seen the VeggieTales version of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I encourage you, don't. <laughs> um, but what is that story? I'm sorry if you love it. I'm just playing. Um, what is that story about? Is it about God's faithfulness to these young men? Yeah, you bet it is. Is it about God's power? You bet. But look deeper. Look at the Milky Way. Daniel 3.29, a foreign king says this, a foreign king. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn from limb to limb and their house laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. That's the point of that story, that a foreign king would worship God. Daniel Four verses one through three, King Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good for me to show you, this is a foreign king, the signs and wonders that the most high God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. What about Daniel and the lion's den? Same thing, Daniel 6, 26, a foreign king says, I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. And then we get to the Psalms. And in almost every Psalm, you see God's heart for the nations. Have you ever noticed it? You ever seen it? Finish this verse. Be still. Is that it? Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted among the earth. So many of us only have half the story, but there's so much more. There's so much more. This week, I, um, I googled Psalm 4610. I wanted to see what came up, and this is what came up. I think I've got a picture there. About 10 rows of people selling wall art that just said this. See, the world wants to drown out what God really cares about. It wants to convince you that everything, all of this, is for your own life. That, that you should just be, now that's not a bad message, be still and know that I'm God. But why? Why are you still? Why should you know that he is God? Because he has power over all nations. His purposes are never ending. He will be exalted in the earth. That's why we're still. It's nothing to do with us. It's everything to do with him. And the world wants to drown this out. Wants to conv convince us that our purposes matter more than God's purposes. Psalm 67, verse 1 and 2. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. So that's a good verse. May God be gracious to us. May he bless us. May he make his face shine upon us, whatever that means, right? But why? Verse 2 that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. See, this thread is everywhere, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. You'll see it in all the scriptures. Matthew read this earlier, Isaiah 49, 6. Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel? I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Ezekiel 36, 22. I love this one. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake. He says it plainly. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profane among the nations. Malachi 1, 11. For, for, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. The world wants to convince you that this does not matter. The enemy wants to make you bored right now because I'm reading too many scriptures. He wants to make you indifferent. Several years ago, I was speaking at a university in Arkansas. I was working for a missions organization. We sent students, 20-somethings, overseas for two years to do mission. And I was speaking at this event that had a ton of students at. And I was thinking, oh, man, like I killed it, 
right? I killed it. I spoke, and it was good, and I spoke clearly, and people were laughing, and I thought, man, there's going to be so many students that are going to want to go overseas. So I finished, and I came off the stage, and I began to talk to students, and I would talk to them about going overseas. And I heard things like, well, I have student loans, or I need to get married, or I need to get some work experience before I go. I need to make some money before I go and do something like that. So I left that a little discouraged, and the next day I had my little table that said, go core, and it said two years overseas on this big banner in the cafeteria at this university. And some Mormon students came up, and they saw my banner, and they went, came up to me, and they said, oh, this is really cool. Can you tell me more about this? So we began to talk, and he asked the question, well, how many students do you send out a year? So I told him, I said, maybe 30 or 40. And this Mormon student kind of smirked. And he went on to tell me that where he is from, every 20-something goes on a two-year mission after they graduate. And they each get a letter, I don't know if you know this, but they each get a letter from their church that tells them where they're going. And this student carries this letter with him wherever he goes. And he pulled it out and he said, this is the letter that I got. And they told me where I'm going. And I thought about that. And I heard someone else say this, but it, it's, I think it's true. In the current state of missions, Mormons give two years. Christians often give excuses. What about the New Testament? The first chapter of the New Testament, we see this thread. You see it literally in the lineage of Jesus, <laughs> that the Gentiles are included in the lineage that would lead to Christ, that in this lineage would lead to a Messiah whom God promised to Abraham would be blessed all nations. So not only does God bless all nations through Jesus, the coming of Jesus is blessed because the nations are included in it. And you continue to see this thread. There's Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, all Gentile women. And by Matthew putting these women in the lineage of Jesus, he is reminding us that his global purposes exist all throughout Scripture. That we are to remember God's promise to Abraham, through you all the peoples of the earth shall be blessed. What about Jesus' ministry? I love it. I've always wondered, why didn't Jesus... Like, just stay in one place. Did he really need to go from city to city to city? Couldn't he have just stayed in one place, done his all his miracles there, and kind of like a, like a church in 21st century? You come to us, and you hear the word. So you come, sit, sit next to me, and I'll teach you, and then you can go away. Luke 4, 42, it says, They tried to keep him from leaving them, but he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also because that is why I was sent. When Jesus clears out the temple, he's, he says in, in Mark eleven seventeen, 17, he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. How many of you have ever wondered when Jesus will come back? You ever wondered that? How many cults have we seen that have tried to figure that out? But what they miss and what we miss is that the Bible actually tells us when Jesus is coming back. Whoa. Let me read it to you. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And then you get the Great Commission. Did you know there's not one Great Commission, but five Great Commissions? There's Matthew 28, 18, go and make disciples of all nations. And then there's Mark, Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Luke 24, 46, and 47, he says, this is, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. John 20, 21 says, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then Acts 1, 8 but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then you get to Paul, <laughs> who said in Romans 15, 20, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I should build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see and those who have never heard will understand. I love Ephesians 2, 12, you can go there with me on this one. I want, I want to sit here for a second. 
He says, remember that at that time, he's talking to Gentiles here, you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So the Jews could look to the future and they could bank on the fact that someone was coming for them. They didn't know what that looked like or what that meant, but they knew that someone was coming. God had made a promise to them, but that promise in their minds was only for them, not the Gentile. And the divide between the Jew and the Gentile was so real, like the racism, the indifference, the the anger towards these groups was so real that they would build walls and you could feel the tension in the temple. There was the Holy of Holies at the temple where the high priest could go, and then there was a place where the priest could go, and then there was a wall where the Jewish men could be. So this was all the inner court. And then after the Jewish men, there was another wall where the Jewish women could go. And then there was a wall behind the Jewish women, and that was where the Gentiles could go, the outer court. And that's also where they put all the animals. And the Gentiles had a name, They were called the far off. Why? Why were they called the far off? Because they were far off from the promises of God. They were far off. So Paul is saying here, those who were far off, outside the covenant, have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. That God has literally taken every wall and broken it down. There's no more walls. It's just one family. He goes on in Ephesians 2, 19, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. I love this one. Um, That word aliens is the word para oikos. So para means by or outside, and oikos means house. So Paul is saying here, you are no longer by the house or outside the house. He's saying you have been invited in. You've been invited into the house, that at one point we were all uninvited to the party, but God, in his grace, through Jesus, looked at those who were outside the house and said, join us. We were all outside a house where a massive celebration of hope and love was happening, and God looked at us and said, come on in, be a part. God is not done bringing outsiders into the house. And then you get to Revelation. Revelation 5, 9, it says they sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Remember the promise to Abraham. Where God started in Genesis 12 will be completed in Revelation. God will do it. There will be a representative from every nation, tribe, and people, and language bowing and worshiping at the feet of Jesus. He will do it. He's a missionary God from cover to cover. So the question that we have to ask as a real church is, does our passion, does our rhythm, does our story match God's story? And the question that I want to answer for the next few minutes is, what do we do with this? How do we get to a point where our rhythm matches God's rhythm, his passion's where we care about what he cares about, where we love what he loves and hate what he hates. What do we do as Renewal Church? How do we respond? First, we have to understand that being a part of God's mission doesn't start with the strategy. It doesn't start with the strategy. It starts with transformation. It's tempting to listen to a sermon like this, and your immediate re- reaction is to pull up your bootstraps and go, Well, let's go. Why are we here? Why am I in school? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why are you still talking? Let's go. And then to come up later with a two-year, 10-step plan on how Renewal Church can be a part of God's mission around the world. But that's not where we start. The problem isn't that we aren't smart enough to reach the nations. The problem isn't that we don't care enough. The problem is that many of us in the church need a better treasure. We need a better treasure. We need to care about something different. That our treasure in this life and our purpose in this life is misplaced and confused. 
any motivation or strategy to give, to go, to pray that isn't driven by the Word of God and the Spirit of God will fail. So if we try to come up with a strategy that really isn't what God is asking us to do, it will fail. Our activity in God's mission begins with worship. Our activity in God's mission begins with worship. Any attempt to do the work of God without God will fail. Matthew 13, 44, I love this text. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Missions begins with Jesus, seeing Jesus as so good, so much better, so much more worthy of our time, our money, our future, our family's future, that we would say, yes, I will buy that field. I'll sell everything for that field, that his word and his spirit is the only thing that can drive us into mission. And it's the only thing that can sustain us in his mission. If we try to concord some kind of strategy, some kind of strategy outside of the purposes of God, we will fail. We will end up exhausted. We will end up disappointing and we will end up compromising as a church because at the end of the day, it's about the success of the strategy and not about his glory among the nations. So we must be careful. We don't, maybe we don't start by going. Maybe it's as simple as we need to be a faith family that falls in love with Jesus, that is transformed by his word, that repents to one another, that confesses our sins and that loves like he loves us. Maybe mission begins there. Second, we must be controlled and compelled into mission by the love of Christ and not controlled and compelled by guilt. Too many times, and I've seen this before, we have people in our churches who are motivated to do things because they feel guilty. They're motivated to do it. They're motivated to go on mission trips. They're motivated to go to church. They're motivated to go on home groups. Not because for the glory of God, because they love him, but because they feel guilty that many of us in here may be doing good stuff for God's mission, but you're exhausted. (laughs) You're, You're just exhausted. You're tired because your motivation for doing things for God isn't for his purposes, but it's, and this sounds harsh, but it's because you want to feel better about yourself. Because you feel Guilty, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, right? God, me and you are okay because I do this. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. If in your heart, your response to hearing God's heart for the nations from Genesis to Revelation, if your response to that is to feel guilty about how much you have not done, then take a second and repent. Confess that. Let Let yourself feel the wickedness of your heart. And after you have done that, move on. (laughs) Move on to something better. That's what repentance is. It's to leave something that's less and move to something that's better. That you wouldn't be compelled to do things by guilt, but you would be compelled to do things because Jesus is just simply better. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 says, For the love of Christ controls us, not guilt not fear. We are controlled, or some of your Bibles may say compelled by love. That's what drives us into mission. And Paul says, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and raised. For the love of Christ controls us. This means that we enter into God's mission, and hear me, free. You're not controlled by guilt anymore. You are free to love. You enter into God's mission free because your sin has been paid for because God doesn't see any guilt in you. It means we enter into God's mission with confidence, not fear, because our minds are controlled by a belief that God is for us, and he's proven in the past his promises in Genesis 12, that the God who made the mountains, who controls the water and the waves with his word, loves us, it means that we enter into his mission for his glory, not ours. He is the hero of the story, not you, not Colton White, not Renewal Church. Jesus is the hero 
of the story. Think about the way you tell your story, your testimony. Right? I challenge you to do this. Go home and write it out. The way you tell your story, are you the hero of the story or is Jesus the hero of the story? Did he save you or did you have some kind of power to chase after him? Who's the hero of the story? Too many times in churches, in their mission, the church is the hero of the story, not Jesus. And so before we enter into mission, may we sure, make sure that we have the hero correct. He's the hero. Third, how do we respond as Renewal Church? May we give our lives to his purposes, even if that means giving up comfort and embracing suffering. Every day, you are being seduced and discipled as to what life is about. Every day. So let me ask you, are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you a disciple of the world? Think about it. Every commercial, every movie, every time you look at your savings account, the way you treat your spouse, the way you talk to your kids, the way you invest for your future, we are being discipled and seduced by the world so that we don't see the worthiness of Christ. The world wants to hide the Milky Way from us. Do you know what the biggest, the two biggest barriers um, for 20-somethings to go overseas are? Um, there are two barriers for 20-somethings that say, okay, I want to go live overseas for at least two years. The first one is debt. That's no surprise. We're all in debt, right? Um, so the first one for 20-somethings, the first barrier for them not going is debt. The second barrier is actually Christian parents. That is the second biggest barrier to seeing 20-somethings go overseas. So the first one isn't surprising, right? But Christian parents, are you sure? They're Christians. So the statistic says, if by chance your son or daughter comes and tells you they want to be a cross-cultural uh, missionary, over 94% of Christian parents will try to talk that 20-something out of going overseas. Katie and I have seen it in our work with GoCore. We've talked to countless students who in tears have said, I want to go, but my parents don't think it's a good idea. And they hear things like, well, it's really dangerous. Are you sure you want to do it? What about your career? You're not going to be able to get a job when you get back. What if you never get married? Like, suddenly every person in the world is going to be married when they get back. <laughs> How are you going to pay for it? Raising support isn't a good way to live your life. Don't you just want to take a trip to Europe instead? <laughs> what about the needs here? See, we are being seduced and discipled by the world. That we would think like the world thinks. That we would miss the thread where suffering is pro problematic, not suffering. Where suffering for Christ isn't, is something to be avoided. And if Christ would have avoided his suffering, we would have no forgiveness. So be careful, because we are being convinced that comfort, wealth, and toys is the goal of this life. May we understand and live out the words of Paul in Philippians 1.21, where he says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Think about that statement. It's a pretty familiar verse, but really think about what he's saying there. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To live as Christ, that great treasure that is worth selling everything for. To live for Christ is to set a blank check in front of God and say, you fill it out for me, whatever you want. How can he say this? How can he say? Think about what he's saying. To live as Christ and to die is gain. The only way that someone could say that, to live as Christ and to die is gain, is if they've lived life in such a way where they have seen Everything else in this world is bankrupt and empty. So you have to ask the question, has Paul seen that? Yes. <laughs> Paul has lived a life and seen everything else in this world is empty and bankrupt compared to Christ. Philippians 3, 7. After laying out all the ways that he's better than everyone else, he says in verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Joining in God's mission begins with this. It starts here. A heart that says there is something better out there. There is a better 
treasure, and his name is Jesus. Lastly, what does this mean for us as a church? What does this mean for you and I? What do we do now? What do we do with this thread? What what do we do with God's heart for the nations? How do we respond? The thing that I would say we need to do first is pray. Before we do anything else, before we strategize and plan and set set aside budgets, we pray. Um, You can see a thread of prayer in the book of Acts where the people of God pray and God responds. I think sometimes we live life as if we pray because we're supposed to, but not because we actually expect God to respond. You ever do that? You just pray because you know that the Bible tells you, your parents tell you, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what we do. We're believers. But do you really believe that God will respond to you? We have been jaded and discipled by the world. I love it. In Acts 2, 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and into the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. And then the next verse says, and all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done. And the apostles in Acts 3, if you remember that story, Peter and John go up to the temple at the time of prayer and a lame man walks. In Acts 4, the disciples pray for boldness and the place, literally the place, they pray for boldness and the place they were meeting shook. Acts 6, it says they devoted themselves to prayer. And then the next verse says, and the word of God continued to improve, increase. And a few verses later, it says the disciples were multiplying greatly in Jerusalem. In Acts 7, Stephen prays. And then in Acts 8, what happens? The church scatters. In Acts 10, Cornelius is praying, and God sends him to Peter, whom God revealed to Peter in a vision that he has made all things clean, therefore allowing the Gentiles to be saved. In Acts 12, I love this one. Peter is in jail, and it says, but earnest prayer for him was made for God by the church, and an angel literally pokes Peter and walks him out. Acts 13, church leaders are worshiping, and it says they were praying. And the Spirit says, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas, and a missionary movement began. It begins with prayer. We can't do the work of God without God, so why would we ignore him? We pray, and the Lord responds. In a moment, we're going to sing um, the song, This We Know. And um, there are a lot of things that the world wants us to remember. It wants us to remember that your savings account matters. It wants you to remember that your security matters. It wants you to remember that the status of your name matters. And Christ says, pick up your cross and follow me. And so the question is, what do you know? What are you confident in? And if you've noticed the thread, he makes a promise in Genesis 12. Well, actually, he makes it in Genesis 3, but we didn't go there. But he makes a promise in Genesis 12, and then you see him fulfill and continue that thread of that promise in every story. So what makes you think that he's forgotten you? What makes you think that he's not for you? He's shown that he is. And if you are asking the question, what am I called to? What is my purpose in this life? And it starts, finding that starts with seeing Jesus as just a better treasure than anything this world has to offer. That's where mission begins. So before we even talk about the unreached and all the things that goes into missions and short-term mission trips and blah, blah, before we even get there, may we find our real treasure in this life we were actually confessing, repenting, sacrificing, and serving one another.